Uh, well, thank you, General Rep. Uh, thank you for all of your, your comments so far. Uh, my first question is, uh, over your career, how have you seen uh, the, the vision of supply chain management, particularly the, how education is, uh, is provided for supply chain leaders within the U.S. military? Yeah, so again, I, um, I'm not a professional logistician. Uh, I'm an engineer, so I s have seen it from afar. We have uh, logistics specialties. We have uh, officers who are trained in um, transportation, uh, trained in logistics, trained in uh, ordnance, which is the, the stuff, uh, and then quartermaster, which are all the little supplies that have to come. They come together, all of those specialties, at about the 14, 15, 16 years of service into what we call a multifunctional logistician. So the, the log logisticians are specialties, transporters or, um, or supply guys, and they, they all come together uh, uh, when they get to about the 16 year mark uh, of their service uh, because you can't have one without the other uh, at that higher uh, level. The, the guys who have to coordinate uh, the supply chains have to understand how transportation uh, links with suppliers of commodities um, and such. And so what was really uh, tremendous in Afghanistan was you had the Defense Logistics Agency, which is a global organization uh, that can provide uh, commodities of about any type, uh, linking up with U.S. Transportation Command, which has both sea and airlift um, nodes in order to, to provide all of the supplies that we needed. And then Army Materiel Command, which was really providing the technical things, the equipment that was necessary. Um, so when I look at supply chain management, I saw it from a user's point of view. Um, and in my job where I had to start bringing the Afghanistan theater uh, down, um, I got to know all, of, all three of those communities uh, and was just uh, deeply impressed by it. But we in the Army train uh, folks in specialties and then bring them together to bring the, the whole package together after about 15 years uh, of service in their specialty. Uh, General Rep, okay, my question will be, uh, basically in private sector and military as well, there are, I mean, supply chain is actually something very important. So we always talk about service level, we talk about cost, we talk about optimization. But uh, is there any formal platform where the private sector and military can do some knowledge sharing or maybe learning best practice from each other? So uh, uh, Lean Six Sigma, um, we took from the, from the uh, private sector uh, when, you, when you're trying to optimize routine uh, and reoccurring functions uh, throughout the supply chain, um, Army Materiel Command really, uh, and Transportation Command looked at um, how do you optimize to, for efficiency. The Army is not um, readily built on efficiency. Uh, we will always take effectiveness over efficiency, which tends to mean too much of commodities because you never want to get caught without something that you need. Uh, but what we have seen is uh, we can do that a lot smarter. Um, and we got those ideas um, from the private sector. The private sector um, also has learned from us about uh, how to create supply chains through um, many different countries that normally would not have um, you know, supported us. You know, the, I would think that the, the U.S. activities in Afghanistan opened up the Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, uh, Kazakhstan, um, uh, uh, Kazakhstan to uh, you know, other companies that would not have normally been um, working with those because of the routes that uh, um, DLA and Transportation Command set up uh, through those. I think there's a great deal that we can learn uh, from each other. I think one of the big things that uh, corporate America is looking at is how we do leader development uh, and the amount of effort that we put into education uh, and part of the whole leader development model throughout the whole range from when somebody just entered uh, to when they're a four-star general. General Rupp, very nice to meet you. I'm from Mexico, <coughs> from the GCLOC program. Um, I want to ask you, when one thinks in military logistics, it's very common first to think in of to move um, 
drops and equipment um, to a mission at downstream supply. But it's important to the re reverse logistics. So um, what have been the biggest challenge to bring in the trust material and equipment back home to the U.S.? Um, uh, for example, in retrograde mission in Afghanistan. Yeah, so as I talked about uh, uh, in the talk we just had, the biggest challenge was that Afghanistan had only been an inbound theater. Nothing really left. So we had almost nine years of bringing things to Afghanistan, but never anything coming back. So there was a mindset of um, you had this motor pool uh, that a company, say, needed 12 vehicles. But there were 36 vehicles in the motor pool because you had the original set that the first unit brought over and they used for a couple of years and then they brought in the second set and so for another couple of years they used that set but they never got rid of the first set and then they're using the third or even fourth set of vehicles um, so you had just a tremendous number of vehicles because nothing ever left so the biggest challenge was getting back to those original vehicles and, and asking uh, the material managers do you want them back in the United States if the answer is no, then have, do you have an agreement to give them or sell them to a foreign country? Uh, no. Do we want us to give them to the Afghans or sell them to the Afghans? No. Then I'm asking permission to destroy them in place because the last thing we want to do is spend all that money, $120,000, to fly a piece of equipment all the way back to the United States from Afghanistan. <coughs> Why would we spend $120,000 to fly it back to, say, Jacksonville uh, and take it to a junkyard and have it junked, uh, you know, and get a couple thousand dollars for the scrap metal? Um, you wouldn't. So it's forcing the enterprise to make decisions about what is there. And once they've made decisions, to have the ability to, uh, to give it to, you know, foreign countries, that's a State Department function, give it uh, to the Afghans, um, destroy it or get it back to the United States. So once we got the decisions made, then it became a logistics exercise of, of destroying a lot of things, putting them on aircraft, getting back, but it, the creation of multimodal routes. If you can't use Pakistan to get it back out, um, don't fly it all the way back to the States. Fly it to the nearest friendly port, dump it off, bring a ship there, put it on because a ship much more efficient than the aircraft is for moving large pieces of equipment. So that was the challenge. It was really a mindset. Everything came in, nothing left. Now we had to turn it around so we get that stuff back out while still fighting a war. Hello, General. Firstly, I, I would like to express my admiration to your profession. And my question is, after the global cri crisis in 2008, the public budgets have been shrinked. So how these changes have affected the, the supply chain in the Army? So the, um, it's, it's a, great, uh, a great point. Our budgets under uh, the Budget Control Act of the summer of 2012 took $1 trillion out of the, uh, the Defense Department budget uh, over a 10-year period. So that caused a great deal of downward pressure on everything that we did. Uh, so it wasn't just supply chain management, now it became decisions. What type of units, if the Army has to shrink from 570,000 down to 450,000, which units do you get rid of? When, the, when it doesn't look like the world has become any less peaceful, you want to be really careful about getting rid of your combat units. So then what happens is there's a lot of pressure on logistics units and they say, well, we'll contract out for that logistics function, we can get rid of that logistics unit because we don't have the money to pay for those people. The problem when you contract out for logistics is if you have to go someplace like Liberia in Ebola, land, you know, a contractor says, I'm not going there. Um, you know, that's where Army soldiers and logisticians. So we've had to be very um, careful uh, as we bring down not to emasculate, to destroy the logistics capabilities of the unit. At the same time, we were in a, uh, an environment, a fiscal environment, where you're fighting two wars where you almost wanted for nothing. Um, hey, we need a new vehicle. You know, they spend billions of dollars to develop the MRAP and rapidly get them over to theater. When the money starts coming down, now hard choices have to be made. What's good enough? 
Um, we can't afford to just, you know, um, throw money at problems because uh, it doesn't exist anymore. So supply chain management had to become much more discriminatory rather than just, you know, large pushes of all kinds of things and you might need 30% of what arrives there, the rest rots or goes bad. It has to become much more discriminatory um, in that regard. And that's why I talked about demand signals uh, that come from the user. Here's what we really need um, translated into logistics terms. You bet. Uh, thank you. Uh, my second question is, um, does the U.S. military have any challenges in attracting and uh, maintaining uh, supply chain talent? And how does the, the U.S. Army War College play a role in uh, addressing those challenges? Yeah, so the Army has not had recruiting challenges to now. We have some challenges in ensuring that we have the right diversity in our officer corps. Um, and so we actively try to recruit um, uh, for diversity because we want the Army to look like America. Um, and so uh, that's important. In our uh, logistics field, um, it is still a very uh, popular place to go. One of the challenges in logistics is the people who um, rise to the four-star level in our Army tend to be the fighters, not the logisticians. So you get a lot of people who want to go into logistics, but their idea of a career is 10 years, get a lot of good experience, and by the time a logistician has finished his eighth year in the Army. He has, he or she has already commanded a company of about 160 to 200 people in complete charge of a logistics element of about 200 people at eight years of service. Out in the private sector, you rarely get that number of, of subordinates until you're 20 or 30 years. So they're very valuable. So for some of our logisticians who think, I can't make it to four star, so at about the 10 year mark, this is a good time to go into corporate America. I've got all of this experience and training. Um, so we don't have a lot of trouble recruiting. We do have to always be concerned about retention because we need those senior, remember it was about the 15 year mark where they come together as those multi-purpose logisticians, uh, the supply chain managers, if you will, rather than individual commodity or technical specialties. Um, we gotta get enough of the good ones there. So the War College, uh, we train strategic leadership. Uh, we get those senior logisticians along with the other branches um, and we get them ready to think of themselves as strategic leaders. And strategic leaders um, uh, have to be the ones who connect what you want to achieve, your ends or your objectives, with what you have available, your means, and through what ways in order to achieve that. You know, the available means through using them in a certain way to achieve certain ends, and then how much risk are you willing to, um, we gotta get people to think that way as strategic leaders. So retention mid-years for logisticians is something that we have to be concerned with because they are valuable uh, outside the Army. Okay. Um, okay, my second question will be, uh, logistic is actually something I would say relatively new compared to other business practices. And then in the corporate world, uh, they are doing a lot of things uh, to improve the system. So for the US military point of view, what are the key improvement areas in terms of uh, logistic practices for the coming five to 10 years, I would say? Yeah, I, I would say um, your premise that uh, logistics is relatively new, um, Logistics has always been there. The big challenge is when we started having centralized supply of armies rather than um, foraging supply of armies, which was the Napoleonic era. Um, and so that started for the US military in about the 1860s, the Civil War, the centralized uh, logistics. Um, uh, but big changes in terms of um, discrimination of logistics as opposed to just pushing everything that's needed having vehicles that can self-diagnose. Uh, instead of p pushing an entire van of every part that could break on a vehicle, only push forward the parts that are actually broken or about to break on the vehicles. Um, that reduces your logistics footprint, allows you the same aircraft to come in with much more mission critical things as opposed to one big van with every part that could be used. Um, uh, 3D printing uh, may change logistics tremendously. I don't know what that looks like. I think we're very good in plastics and polymers. I'm not sure 
Um, you know, if you can fabricate repair parts, you certainly can't do that in the in the kind of military grade materials that we need right now, but five, 10 years from now, I mean, that could be amazing. You don't actually push parts forward. You push a big machine forward with, with raw materials and you fabricate the parts uh, in place. Um, I don't know what that uh, that's gonna lead to, but it's certainly gonna be revolutionary. In your opinion, what has been the most important military logistics um, and supply chain innovation or technology that in recent years? which has a low efficient logistics in operations and military operations as um, Afghanistan and why? Yeah, um, I wish now I was a professional logistician and I could tell you the, uh, um, it gets to this idea of um, knowing what you need and not just um, sending everything that you could possibly need. Uh, that requires a diagnostic capability uh, at the forward part, what do we need? Um, uh, it requires the ability of the warehousing back in the states to be able to rapidly get the things that are needed, uh, and then the transportation infrastructure to to get it there um, uh, quickly. The the data links through the logistics field, um, you know, they rival the operational links. You know, we always talk about we need all this satellite bandwidth in order to do intelligence and operations. Um, a tremendous amount of satellite bandwidth is needed for the logistics to be able to correctly identify what is needed and when is it needed. Uh, so we're not bringing the whole mountain to Afghanistan, we're only bringing the parts of the mountain that are actually needed um, there. That is, uh, it's a different way of thinking about things. Um, you know, 10 years ago, well look at the first Gulf War. I was, I was in the first Gulf War. We, we got there to Saudi Arabia, we waited for four months until we built this huge logistics mountain uh, behind us and we said, okay, I think we got enough stuff, let's go. Um, we're, no one's gonna give us you know, four or five months to build that, that logistics mountain and we don't need to. A lot of, uh, there's a lot of waste uh, in doing that. And so um, uh, the ability to discriminate uh, in what is needed and that, I think, private sector because th efficiency is important, the profit margins and everything else, they can't just be thinking of effectiveness. Um, that it is, uh, uh, we're learning from the private sector on how to do that. Um, it is uh, uh, pretty exciting. Um, and uh, my hat's off to the professional logisticians because I've always just been in the, hey, I need fuel and, uh, and I'm in the middle of Afghanistan, I need 300,000 gallons per day, figure out how to get it here and they would do it, and I was, I was just like, wow, that's, that's impressive. Finally, I would like to ask uh, about the flexibility of the United States Army in terms of inventory. I think that it's difficult to predict the magnitude of a, of, a, of a conflict, so I would like to know if do you have contracts with suppliers that could assure the immediate uh, supply? Yeah, again, you're, you're out of my lane of expertise. The Defense Logistics Agency always maintains a large portfolio of suppliers um, and uh, with flexible contracts to, uh, uh, to be able to, you know, whether they are IDIQs, uh, indefinite uh, delivery, indefinite quantity um, uh, kind of contracts. We don't know how much of this we're going to need, but, you know, be prepared up to this. Um, so Defense Logistics Agency uh, runs that. Uh, the Transportation Command uh, has contracts with carriers, uh, whether it is civilian uh, seven, you know, rented 747s or sea lift uh, carriers, so that when commodities are needed, the contracts are in place, uh, both from a commodity plus the delivery mechanism uh, to get them uh, where they need to go. Uh, it, uh, it allows for this, this sense of logistics discrimin discrimination um, so you're not just pushing everything uh, forward. Um, I wish I uh, was, I, I stand in awe of the logistics community, um, but uh, the, uh, their ability to, to get just about anything. The challenges that we're having right now is acquisition. Um, acquisition of something new uh, takes a long time and it's very expensive. I mean, we're seeing it with some of the big weapons programs, you know, the F-35 for the U.S. Air Force or a big ship for the Navy. Um, uh, how can we more rapidly uh, acquire things? Because as you know, technology changes so fast 
by the time we go through the six year program to develop something and you know get it vetted through everybody and all these gates, by the time it comes out, it's almost obsolete um, based on some you know innovations that have happened uh, in that meantime. So how can we do acquisition reform? Um, uh, all plays together with uh, with supply chain management in order to get the right things, um, you know, for our soldiers and our airmen and our sailors, wherever they happen to be. So, it was great hearing all of your experiences in Afghanistan and all the the lessons that you learned there. How does the U.S. military capture and and share those supply chain lessons uh, for future? Uh, efforts. So, you know, one of the things the United States Army learned in the 1990s is to ruthlessly do what we call after-action reviews. So every time something happens, uh, we sit down and we talk about what happened, how could it have gone better, what are the lessons that we've learned. We've created a whole organization at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas called the Center for Army Lessons Learned that captures all of those lessons so you don't have to relearn them uh, in the next time. Our logistics schools do the same thing. You know, how did we do this? What lessons did we learn from it? Um, how do we get that back into what we're teaching in the schools so that what we're teaching is informed by the lessons that we're learning in places like Afghanistan or Djibouti or uh, wherever uh, our troops happen to be? Um, and I think that that's one thing that uh, uh, private organizations can learn from us is this ruthless um, critical reviews of, of what we did and how we learned from it and change what you're teaching at the youngest levels in order to, uh, uh, you know, to make sure that you're not relearning those lessons again. Well, guys, I want to thank you for, uh, for taking the time. Um, this is fabulous. I apologize for uh, for not being able to technically answer a lot of the logistics questions. Um, uh, supply chain, chain management uh, is rarely the end all be all, but it is the absolute key facilitator of success in whatever you know, business uh, or military operation. So uh, my hat's off to you. I know it's a tough program and uh, the school teacher in me says continue to study hard uh, because that it, uh, it is important to, uh, to do well and um, and take what you've learned here back to uh, to corporations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Have a great day.